at a time when investors are confronted with market volatility and a variety of challenges fueled by the uncertainty of inflation, unsettled geopolitical tensions, and economic pressures, Justin Klein and Steve Peasley stand ready to take your finance and investment questions and share their unbiased answers. This is Invest Talk, independent thinking, shared success. Invest Talk is made possible by KPP Financial, a registered investment advisor firm serving clients throughout the United States. The clarity for your path forward starts now. Here is KPP Chief Executive Officer, Financial Advisor, Justin Klein. Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. This is our Friday, October 14th, 2022 edition. We are now well into the fourth quarter, and volatility is here, and volatility in my esophagus is as well. Uh, if it, you see me pause today, it's probably because I have a pretty bad bout of heartburn, but I'm going to try to fight through it. So if you hear me pause, uh, it's probably just a, one of those. Now, I'm Justin Klein. I'm working today for Steve Peasley, and I look forward to this hour on Invest Talk with you answering your finance and investment questions. And I'm going to do my very best to provide you unbiased answers to those questions. And the phone number, as always, is 888 chart You can call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we also love your live calls as well, four to five Pacific time. And I've got a packed podcast for you today. Now, my main focus point concerns the story behind this question. Is there a reasonable strategy for investing cash in today's bear market? And it's an interesting article uh, that uh, you can find on investtalk.com, but it, there's some things I agree with, uh, things I don't agree with in this uh, this article, but I want to go through them. And the author kind of has, a, has an axe to grind, uh, so I want to try to give the upside and the downside of how to, uh, of, of the various choices that you should make. That's why I really like it, it's just going over the various choices that you have and what might fit you every different asset class that you can allocate your capital towards right now has potential risks and potential rewards uh some more intensified than others right now versus normal times but i wanted to just unpack all of that as much as i can for you today i also have some other topics as well including the commercial rear, sorry, the industrial, not just commercial, the industrial real estate market and the trends there. Also, social security cost of living adjustment. That is a bit different than your normal CPI calculation. It's called CPIE, which we're going to look at. Uh, we're going to look at all of these and we're going to unpack the data there. And then lastly, bank profits where we've got a few uh bank profit reports today we have some more on monday but what is that looking like how are interest rates impacting bank profits consumers Im impacting bank profits wall street in general right the investment banking arm of banks all of that and so i wanted to look at that sector as well now i see we have some voice bank input to get to today, we have questions on 401k plans, and we hope to have time to fit in an iTunes review question or two as well. Now, it is Friday, and I will be sharing a brief highlight from the newest KPP Premium newsletter that will come out tomorrow morning. Now, I've got all this planned for this episode of Invest Talk, and of course, I will take your live calls as well at 888 chart now let's take a look at the market today. We had the S&P off about 86 points, and yesterday it was up somewhere around 90 something points. So it was two days combined, right? A lot of volatility. Opened down dramatically yesterday, had a huge reversal, so then closed near the highs of the day, which was a bullish sign, but we wanted follow through. Well, today we didn't get follow through. We got a, a pullback. Now. Net net, we're still positive. We're still above where we were at the start of yesterday. Uh, but uh, and yesterday was a one of the most bullish days on record uh, in one day. Right, a five percent move from low to high, uh, huge reversal near a fifty-two week low, 
And that very often, if you look back in history, marks a, a bottom. Now, it can double bottom later, um, but it, it is typically a big sign. But it's only one day. And so you need to string multiple days together to get a, a durable bottom. Now, what I will say is, and this is a, a lesson, when you see a lot of volatility, that is the market. And when I say volatility, a lot of people have volatility downside. Meaning, when I say volatility, I mean big up days, big down days, kind of clustered together in a relatively short period of time. That's the market trying to create a bottom, trying to find a bottom or a top, right? If the market is, is in a strong uptrend and all of a sudden you see big sell offs, big rallies, big sell offs, big rallies, that's the market topping, okay? So now that doesn't necessarily mean this is the bottom. Doesn't necessarily mean it has the bottom, but it's showing signs of that. Showing signs of that. And I will tell you this, sentiment is horrendous. Everybody I talk to, nobody wants to commit any capital to the equity markets right now. Nobody. I'll tell you this as well, that Previously, in the history, in, in, in my 20 plus years of doing this, when everyone's like that, it's usually a pretty good time to be committing some capital. When it's hardest, when you feel sick to your stomach, that's usually the time you want to be committing capital. When everything feels rosy and look how good things are and hey, my cousin, my neighbor and uh, uh, my brother, they're, they're killing it. They're doing really well. That's usually the time when you want to pull back risk, pull away from the market. Not always, but those sentiment indicators are pretty good. And when it's broad based one way or the other, you got to listen. But we're at the end of the week. It was a choppy week and we had option X week next week. And I think we'll get a little more clarity as we get past next week. Uh, and if we get some fall, if we get some closes above yesterday's high, that would be a very bullish sign. But once again, we need that follow through. Now let's get to our first listener question now. Hi, Justin. Hi, Steve. This is Joyce from New Jersey. Thank you for a very informative show. Could you please give your opinion about NEA tax exempt municipals in a taxable account, which pays a nice dividend. And could you please comment on T-Row, T-R-O-W? I bought it around 130 and it's done quite a bit. Is it a buy, more, hold, or sell at the current price? Again, thank you for a great podcast. All right. I'll start with the first question, which is tax-exempt municipals in a taxable account. This is typically best for if, if you're in a high tax bracket. Pretty much the highest. You have, to, you have to make a lot of money, be very wealthy, and just paying you know, a marginal rate of 50%, typically for you know, your, well, it depends on what state you're in, but let's call it you know, the, the highest federal tax bracket. And then those are usually fairly good investments. If you're smart about it, I don't, I don't know what exactly uh, municipals you're looking at, but um, that's typically only who it's good for. Why is because those that are very wealthy and are in that high tax bracket, they're going to drive prices of munis up to a level where the yield is so lo low that it's tax advantage for them. But if you're not in the highest tax bracket, you much rather be in taxables pay that lower tax rate and your effective yield is typically going to be higher, right? Whereas them, if the, the, those, those, those in the high, high tax bracket, they don't want to buy those taxables because, you know, their effective tax rate will be probably uh, at or lower than what their municipals are, are yielding them. Okay. So only if you're in a very high tax bracket. Okay. Number one. Uh, now T row price, T R O W. And this is, one of the largest mutual fund companies in the world. At the end of August, they had $1.3 trillion in managed assets. So 
54% in equity funds, 30% in balanced, uh, 13% in fixed income, and 3% alternative. So what you're seeing here is their business is struggling because asset prices are falling. This is a leveraged bet really on the equity markets. They have overhead, they have offices, they have marketing teams, they have portfolio advisors that run mutual funds and, and all their different, different funds. And when times are good, they make a lot of money. Maybe $8 a share in 2019. And then 2021, when asset prices were high, they made $12.75. But this year, it's supposed to be down 37% to $8.02, back to basically pre-pandemic levels. And does yield 4.9%, which is nice. Let me look at their debt levels. Look that up real quick. Uh, but the reason why it's levered is because when asset prices are higher and their their fee base is is larger, then their 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 structural costs on a yearly basis aren't really changing very much, right? That overhead. So that's why you see that leverage to asset prices in general. And this has been a year where. Uh, at equities and bonds have gone down. That's where ma they're mainly invested in, right? Equities and bonds, and they're all down 20 plus percent. Now, the good thing about this company, it doesn't have any debt. Actually, it's net cash on its balance sheet. It is, let's see, is it buying back shares? Yeah, it's buying back shares. I like that. Um, so if we are finding a, a relatively durable bottom over the next quarter or two, I think this is going to be a good investment. If, Equity, this is just a, a supercharged bet really on the equity markets, to be honest with you. Now, one thing I like about it is that the indexes, there's been a lot of money flowing out of active funds into indexes over the last decade plus. That's starting to shift now that active funds are are, are improving uh, and the broad index, indexes are heavily weighted towards tech, which is underperforming. So I like that. Um, so I think there are some, some opportunities there, but you... You're gonna you're gonna really just take above average risk here, uh, and you have to be willing to do that. And if you are willing to do that, then I'm gonna give T Row Price a thumbs up. Now this is Invest Talk. We're very happy to hear the caller questions that come in via our voice bank recordings. But it's worth mentioning that we love interacting with our live callers as well from four to five Pacific time. So if you're listening now during that time, our number never changed. Eight 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 ninety nine chart. Why do listener questions make Invest Talk better? Which of these would you recommend? Because each caller presents fresh questions in their voice. I was curious if you still think aluminum has a ways to go from here. When do I know the right time to take profits? Should I be looking for an exit? Should I be holding here? And listeners instinctively realize that Invest Talk uniquely offers a welcome dose of investing satisfaction. I think you have a terrific show and I've learned a whole lot. Hey guys, love your show. Uh, I've been listening for several years now and I've learned a lot. Justin Klein and Steve Peasley understand what investors need and want. I would look at it from a tax perspective. If there's no tax implications, move on, find better ways to use that money. I'm going with the odds. I think a half position now would at least get you in it and get you watching it so you won't lose track of it. Don't forget to call Investor. 888-99-CHART. Each day, Invest Talk listeners submit their finance and investment questions via phone or email. Would you like your question to be put near the top of the list? Just take a minute or two to leave a review and rating for Invest Talk at iTunes. And be sure to include a brief question with your iTunes review comments. And of course, your calls are always welcome 24 7. Don't forget to call Invest Talk, 888 99Chart. Now on Friday, Steve generally makes time to fit in a quick rundown of key benchmark numbers. So let's hit that now. The two-year treasury was at 4.5%. That's up from 4.3% last week, 4.16 two weeks ago, and 3.8% four weeks back. And then the 10-year treasury, that was also up to a little over 4%, 4.01% from 3.865 last week. And obviously, a lot of this has to do with the hot inflation numbers, slightly hot. I mean, 8.2 versus 8.1, a 
modestly hot there. Uh, and this was at 3.73 just a month ago. So about a quarter point increase from last week, or from a month ago, excuse me. Uh, gold was at 1645 down slightly from 1700 last week. And silver today was at 1822. That was at $20.22 last week. This is all due with the strong dollar. Oil at 62, 86, excuse me, 86.20. That's down from 92 last week and 78 the week before. So definitely a lot of gyrations. And the national average for gasoline, $3.90 down from 11 weeks ago when it was $4.25. Here in California, the average now is $6.15 down a tick from last week. Now we're heading to a break. I'm ready to answer your questions live at 888 chart The stock market is volatile. It's constantly changing. So how are you positioned? Is your portfolio properly balanced or are you taking unnecessary risks? You can get guidance anytime for free if you go to investtalk.com and take the brief risk quiz. Now, my main focus point today concerns the story behind this question. Is there a reasonable strategy for investing cash in today's market? And this is an interesting article. There is a, a an axe to grind by the author, but I did want to go over it and kind of uh, give you my take on at least his decisions. Now, what he says is he bought I bonds. So he's talking about $250,000 $250, in cash that he has. How is he deploying it? So I bonds, number one, $10,000, maybe buying another 10 for his wife or another and, and some more for his, his kids as well trying to max that out. And I think that's, uh, that's certainly fine. Now, the first thing you have to consider is your risk tolerance level, and making sure you're not not taking too much risk. And the ultimate goal is financial independence. So looking well beyond the next three months, six months, or even year, because for most of you, this, this money or this any investment you're making are going to be longer term. Okay, so how will this eventually get you to a larger nest egg so that you can have a more consistent uh, income, ideally passive income, et cetera, okay? Now, his first choice is treasury bonds. And I think there's, for going back to that caller before the break about muni bonds, I think that's a, 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 an option if you have high income. So that's something to think about. Now, three-year treasury rates is somewhere in the 4.5% range, which I think is pretty enticing for a lot of people. Now, what I would say is that's probably only if you're conservative or moderately conservative. Now, if you start to become more of a moderate investor, I definitely would be dabbling into high-quality corporate bonds, uh, now yielding roughly 7%. So you're going to get uh, 250 to 300 basis points higher than you're going to get in treasuries. And I think that's probably worth it over a, uh, you know, a three, four, five year time frame. Uh, the, the risk that you're taking in an inflationary environment is relatively muted as long as you're being smart about the, the bonds that you're buying. So that's one thought process there. Bonds is fine. Treasuries, you know, four and a half percent or sorry, three, four, yeah, four and a half percent isn't going to really keep you above inflation, it might keep you up to inflation. We expect inflation to be roughly about that uh, level by middle of next year as base effects take hold and you know economy cools, et cetera. Um, so ideally I wanna be above inflation. And so if I can lock in seven, seven and a half percent, I think that is ideal. Now the next thing would be to make sure all of your tax deferred accounts are, are maxed out. Roth IRAs, traditional IRAs, 401ks, SEP IRAs, 529 plans, et cetera. Whatever you have, try to make sure you, you, you max that. If you haven't done that yet, this is a pretty good time to do that. And then going into next year, we're only a few months away, two and a half months away from 2023, maybe front load some of those contributions as well as stocks are you know relatively cheap now. Once again, where is the ultimate bottom? We don't know, but it's probably lurking. Let's just say that. Now, number three is probably the one that I disagree with the most 
for him. Now, he provides out a lot of links, so I think there's an axe to grind here. He says private equity funds. And I cannot disagree more than this, more with this. And he talks about venture back debts and how it's outperformed, blah, blah, blah. It's just leverage bet on an equity. And when the cost of equity is finally something versus next to nothing, those funds aren't going to do very well and their fees are pretty high. So uh, I would say absolutely X number three on his list, which is private equity, venture funds, private REITs, all of that is just a bad place to be. Uh, number four, he talks about real estate. I think maybe investing in your own home, remodeling things uh, opportunistically as uh, maybe you find sales on, on, on flooring or whatever, uh, and the ability to maybe do it yourself. I think that's a good, always a good way to allocate some capital. Uh, five, pay down any high, high debt or high interest debt. I think that's certainly uh, a, a, an option. And then lastly, I agree with him, education. This is a time where investing in yourself can really pay dividends. And so I'm going to give that one a big thumbs up. Now let's go to Alberto in San Jose looking at UNH. Alberto? Can you hear me? Well, yeah, uh, just lo love the show. Um, I was looking at UNH. Um, I know the market's been very volatile, but I haven't seen this one go down. Should I be waiting or should I be getting into it now? I would be waiting. Uh, I've, I don't think UNH is, uh, UNH is doing well uh, in a tight labor market, uh, in, in an environment where the government is not uh, really, doesn't have an eye towards the rising costs of health insurance. You know, they've started to put their ire towards, towards uh, uh, prescription drugs. And, you know, the drug, the, the insurance companies kind of wrote Obamacare. Um, and I just don't see that whole system maintaining long term. Uh, you still see excessive uh, inf cost inflation there. Um, and I'm just not a fan of, of UNH. And I think it's very expensive at these levels. So I'm going to pass on UNH. Thanks for the call. Now we're heading to a break, and I welcome your finance and investment questions now. No question is too simple or too complex. You set the agenda, so give us a call at 888 chart These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team, faster and for free. It's easy to create a free job post on LinkedIn Jobs. To spread the word that you are hiring, add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile. And with LinkedIn Jobs, simple tools like screening questions make it effortless to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience, so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. This is why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one for delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. Listen, you want to finish the year strong, and adding the right team member, the right hire, might help you do that. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk with faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com invest. That's linkedin.com slash invest to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Do you have questions about FDIC security, mortgages, money market funds, losses to your retirement plans? Give us a call today, 888-99-CHART. How about we heat things up tonight? Mm, how so? Get a little fresh, add some steam, sizzle, and spice. <laughs> Wait. You're talking about going to Outback again, aren't you? Fire things up at Outback Steakhouse. For a limited time, try our Bloomin' Fried Shrimp. Or get fresh with our new strawberry salad. Go big with our bone-in ribeye. Or the filet and grilled shrimp on the barbie. Then cool off with a cucumber crush or peanut koala. Try them all before they're gone. Let's Outback. 
Take charge of your purchases with a Cashback Rewards credit card from Pathways Financial Credit Union. Make purchases anywhere, anytime, and get 1.5% cash back for each dollar you spend. That's right, 1.5% cash back for each dollar you spend. Visit PathwaysCU.com. That's PathwaysCU.com to find out more about the Cashback Rewards credit card from Pathways. Pathways Financial Credit Union, your true financial partner. Member NCUA Equal Housing Lender. You are listening to Invest Talk. We've seen the markets go up, then down, sideways, and around. It's called volatility. And if you're a serious investor, you'll have finance and investment questions for Justin Klein. He's here now taking your calls live. Invest Talk, 888 99Chart. Let's go to Eric in Virginia looking at Porsche. You there? Eric, you there? Maybe not. All right, well, I'll cover Porsche. Uh, this is one of the most profitable manufacturers. Oh, Eric, you there? Hey, sorry, I was on mute, my bad. No problem, no problem. Uh, so, you're looking at Porsche, what do you yeah. What do you like about it? So um, I wanted to talk about um, potential mistakes um, you, I've heard you talk in the past about how it's good to learn from your mistakes, and I'm wondering if I made one here. So I did buy it around eight, eight and change, um, as you know, as an electric play through Volkswagen. Um, and I kind of thought that the IPO of Porsche, like the manufactured Porsche, not to be confused with Porsche, the um, holding company, would be a positive thing. Um, but I'm wondering, in hindsight, now that the dust has settled, if that was just diluting shares, or if, if this is just down with the overall market. What are your thoughts? I just think it's down with the overall market. Just look at the, the this is basically a play on uh, Volkswagen, to be honest with you. Uh, and it's just a different way to play it because uh, Porsche owns a percentage of Volkswagen. It's a, it's a percentage ownership of Volkswagen. So Vol Volkswagen stock is down, then Porsche stock is going to be down. Now, I do think it's trading at a larger discount than it should B, there are some uh, potential litigation issues and everything, but I, I don't think that's warranted. Um, so if I'm gonna if I'm gonna buy one or the other, I'd rather own Porsche over the long term because I think that discount will uh, will shrink uh, over time, and so I think it's a, a better way to play it. But it's still going to be correlated with the overall Volkswagen stock, and this is why this is a good example of why I just don't love large allocations to any of the car makers, any of them, Ford, GM, Tesla, Porsche, Volkswagen. It's not a good business. I know it's sexy. I know it sounds great. I know everyone wants to play the electric vehicle transition, but it's not a good business. It's extremely capital intensive. And even the best run, Volkswagen is the best run car company in the world. When you're talking about the strength of their brands from Audi to Porsche to Bentley to Lamborghini, they have some of the best names in the industry. And they're also one of the most efficient when it comes to manufacturing, you know, their quality is better than, than most. Maybe not the best in the industry, but better than most. Their, their styling is probably better than most. And their profitability is better than most. It is, in my book, clearly the best run automobile maker in the world. Guess what? Still down dramatically because the whole industry is. If you want to play EVs, bet on the things that go into EVs. Don't be betting on car companies to play that that game. It's just you're stacking the chips against yourself. Thanks for the call, Eric. 
Now, the KPP Premium Newsletter was finished today, and it will be distributed to subscribers tomorrow morning, and I have a preview. Now, in the market conditions section, we explained that this was another roller coaster week on Wall Street. Investors were eager to learn about the recent inflation report for September. Now, the producer price index, a measure of prices the US that, that U.S. businesses get for the goods and services they produce, increased 0.4% for the month compared to the Dow Jones estimate of 0.2% gain. On a 12-month basis, PPI rose to 8.5%, but that was a slight deceleration from 8.7% in August. Now, the Consumer Price Index increased 0.4% for the month, more than the 0.3% the Dow Jones estimate, according to the BLE, BL, uh, BLS. Now, on a 12-month basis, the so-called headline inflation was up 8.2%, often its peak around 9% in June, but still hovering near the highest level since early 1980s. Now, the hot inflation will boost Social Security payments and checks will be 8.7% fatter in 2023, the largest cost of living adjustment to benefits in four decades. Now, the market initially sold off on the CPI report with the Dow Jones plunging over 500 points, but that was short-lived. An hour later, the market skyrocketed in positive territory up over 900 points, and we will advise caution when buying into this type of rally. But once again, this volatility is a good thing. Now, we'll see these reports as ammunition for the Fed to continue its increases and may even give it a reason to go higher. This could push the Fed funds rate to 4.75. Higher yields will most will most definitely add stress to the financial markets and is unclear the full consequences of this unprecedented tightening policy. So that was the premium newsletter. Oh, and stock ideas, we are gonna focus on an iconic manufacturer of heavy equipment, power solutions, and locomotives. Been around since 1925, and it's the world's largest manufacturer of heavy equipment with over 13% market share as of 2021. It is divided into four segments, construction industries, resource industries, energy, transportation, and financial services. It's trading right around its 50-day moving average and about 10% off its 200 Day moving average. This is a volatile landscape and investors need to be vigilant as economic news and political narrative changes and impacts the market daily. However, this is a great company with strong fundamentals and we think it should be on everyone's watch list moving forward. And we also look at a holding company engaged in providing a range of commercial and personal property and casualty insurance products and services to businesses, governments, associations, and individuals. It has three segments, business insurance, bond and specialty insurance and personal insurance as one of the best performing stocks of 2022 up 6.2% year to date and its financial reports or financial results have been very good uh, with uh, underwriting margins and free cash flow showing the company being substantially undervalued. Now we name names in the premium newsletter once again it comes out tomorrow and there's a good deal of valuable, valuable information in the KP premium newsletter. When you subscribe to Invest Talk at investtalk.com, you will receive the newsletter each Saturday morning via your inbox. Now let's pivot to that COLA adjustment. I think that's something that I just mentioned, we just mentioned in the newsletter, and I wanna go over that a little bit more, and that's the cost of living adjustment for Social Security. And for the second year in a row, the COLA adjustment will be higher than normal CPI figures. Uh, this was released on Thursday by the Social Security Administration. And this is higher, let's see, what was it? The CPIE for everyone else was 8% on average for the year. The COLA will be 8.7. Uh, last year, COLA was 5.9 ahead of the 4.8% rise in the normal CPI. So once again, second year in a row, nearly 1% increase for those uh, Social Security recipient, recipients, more than you would expect otherwise. Now, why is it different? Well, the index is different because people 62 and older don't spend in the same way as everyone else. They devote more money to medical care, housing, and to things like transportation. Now, the past uh, couple of years, CPI has been driven by gasoline prices, energy prices, and that's really pushed up inflation but medical costs have been more muted, at least the rise in medical costs. And so why is it different? Well, it, until the 1970s, Congress needed legislation to raise Social Security benefits 
But beginning in 1975, Congress set benefits to automatically adjust for inflation, and they used the common figure. But in 1986, the Social Security COLA came out to a only 1.3% because gasoline prices fell 23% that year. But medical costs jumped 8%. So what happened was retirees, they bombarded Congress. And there were congressional hearings about it. And the Senate eventually voted 95 to 0 for a proposal to estimate costs for typical Americans for uh, age 62 and older. And, you know, the the there's still a problem, though, with this is because, first off, uh, it's called CPIE. And the CPIE, is, E stands for elderly. So people were that were 60, over 62 were kind of bristled at the fact that they were called elderly. Uh, but it also didn't really track retiree spending as well as they had hoped. Why? Because some people that are over 62 are still working, right? It also doesn't include senior discounts. Now, that's probably a good thing for the, the seniors, but uh, it doesn't include that. And... And this is uh, this is something that a lot of people about worrying about Social Security's sustainability has uh, kind of pushed back against using this number. And a 2003 New York study said switching the CPIE would bankrupt Social Security five years earlier. Um, so uh, interesting little history there. But that's why the so the COLA adjustment is going to be uh, a little bit higher than the typical uh, inflation rate. But for years, it was actually undershooting. So when energy prices were low uh, and there were other uh, types of inflation, you you didn't get, uh, they didn't get to catch up. So this is kind of a catch up for the last couple of years from previously undershooting. Now let's pivot back to the Invest Talk Voice Bank for a question that came in earlier on 888-99 chart. Hello, Steve or Justin. This is Nathan from Wisconsin. Uh, love the show. Love your non-biased opinions. No pressure opinions. So I have a question on my 401k. A while ago, I signed up for Bloom, which is a 401k management program. And looking at my statements, I'm 32% invested in Global International, and I never intended to be more than 10%. So I'm wondering if I should hold that till things get better internationally, or if I should just lower it down right now. I'm 25% in small cap, 31% in multi cap, 8% in fixed income, and 3.6% in pimp coal commodities. And if I should sell off the 20%, where should I allocate it? Thank you. Bye. Well, your allocation is pretty aggressive. You have a lot of international, a lot of small cap exposure, and you know, long term, those asset classes tend to do fairly well. And if you look at the valuations abroad, this is uh, it is a pretty cheap time to be buying those uh, those foreign stocks, but they're cheap for a reason. You have a lot of geopolitical concerns. It doesn't seem like those are going away with what's happening in Russia and Ukraine, as well as uh, the political wins when it comes to China and Taiwan, etc. Uh, so there's there's just a lot of considerations that means that they should be cheaper. Uh, and then you, when it comes to the dollar, the dollar is strong, and that pushes down the value of the businesses uh, over there that are translated, those currencies are translated back into dollars. So all of those reasons mean that those foreign investments are cheaper. Now, is 30% too high? It is on the aggressive side. Would I be aggressively lowering that right now? Probably not because uh, of where the dollar is and likely the dollar is going to be weaker going forward versus uh, stronger, at least in the, the, you know, the medium to long term. Uh, so, you know, I, I would up the commodities. I probably would pull back a tiny bit on, on, on uh, international, but not dramatically so just because, like I said, it is it is cheap. Uh, you know, this is this goes back to, though, the fact that you're using Bloom. Uh, it's a robo advisor. Uh, you really don't have maybe much input. I don't know how much input you really have. Uh, and, you know, they're just using these algorithms without thinking about what makes sense for the current market environment. Uh, so I would encourage you to move away from Bloom and try to make your own decisions here. Now, every now and then, I like to play two in a row. So let's squeeze in another question now. Hi, I was calling about PayPal. 
I was reading online that they put a policy out that they would charge $2,500 for anybody that put uh, something on social media that, that they think is not real. Uh, a lot of people started selling their stock and closing their accounts with PayPal. I just wanted to know if uh, I should keep my shares or is now is the time to sell them before this gets worse. Thank you for your help. All right, PayPal Holdings. And they did, there was a leak on that. So they did pull back that policy and said it was in an error. Who knows whether they're telling the truth or not. Uh, clearly, uh, I believe it was the Consumer Protection Agency came out and basically said, you're not allowed to do that. So whether they wanted to do that or not, they they can't <laughs> um, based on, uh, you know, the current administration's uh, stance on, on the issue, which... Uh, I certainly agree with. Uh, now, is this a reason to buy? I don't know if I'd go that far. Um, you know, it is relatively cheap, but PayPal's growth is slowing dramatically as uh, their business boom during the pandemic, and that's pulling back. And then you have kind of longer term threats when it comes to what they call it direct bank pay. Bank, I forgot what they, what. JP Morgan calls it, but they're, they're looking at this. They're looking at ways to basically usurp the existing payment platforms, whether that's Visa, MasterCard, whether that's PayPal and go directly from your bank account to another bank, uh, or to, or, or to a merchant, excuse me. And I think that's a long-term threat, uh, to, to PayPal. So I don't think this is a great by this point until, until there's some clarity on uh, long term with their business. So uh, I don't like that but policy that came out, even though they were able uh, to to implement it. Uh, I know there's a lot of people up in arms about it, but they weren't able to implement it. Uh, and uh, I just don't like that that long term headwind. So I'm passing on PayPal. Now, this is Invest Talk. I'm Justin Klein. We have one goal here. Each and every weekday is to help you achieve your own version of financial freedom. And our work continues after this final break. So get your questions in now. Alan from Hayward, hang on, you will be next. This is Invest Talk. For serious investors, it's all about achieving financial freedom. That's why the unbiased guidance offered by Steve and Justin is so valuable. The Invest Talk Anytime listener lines are open now, and Steve and Justin welcome your questions. Call 888 99Chart. Good talk to Alan and Hayward looking at ITUB, which is a Brazilian bank. You own it or looking to buy it? I was looking to buy it. I just noticed that their, uh, their sales are, are increasing, and um, I, I just wanted to know what, what you thought about it. Well, this is a Brazilian bank, and with anything Brazil, it's going to be high risk uh, because Brazil, it's still a country, while large, uh, influential in South America, it is very volatile politically and economically. Now, the good thing about Brazil right now, at least, is that they are an export rich, an export, uh, sorry, sorry, commodity rich, an export uh, dependent nation, meaning they send a lot of oil uh, across the world, and that has benefited their currency. And then on top of that, the central bank has been raising interest rates uh, consistently. It's gone from two percent at the start of 2021 to 13 and a quarter as of June of this year. So you know, it's uh, banks when interest rates go up, they benefit from those rising uh, interest rates, and their business has uh, certainly uh, benefited as well making uh, 61 cents expected to make this year. That's up from 37 cents in 2020. Uh, but you're going to be very exposed to the Brazilian currency. Uh, if oil prices pull back, that's certainly going to be an issue. If you have geopolitical, or if you have uh, political unrest, right, they're going through an election. Uh, I don't know the details in intimately, uh, but they have been known to, if you get somebody that's too extreme economically, They've been known to nationalize certain uh, businesses. Now, usually those are raw commodities versus uh, banks, but that's certainly a possibility as well. And that means profits, your profit that you are entitled to supposedly goes away. So understand that risk as well. Now, it is 
I would say relatively cheap compared to history. Uh, and its relative strength is strong, 95, which is very good. Um, but understand the risks here and keep it a very small percentage of your overall exposure to foreign markets. Thanks for the call. That was I-T-U-B. I don't even want to say the name. It's too difficult. <laughs> anyway, let's pivot last to the warehouse industry. And you're starting to see a tick up in warehouse vacancies. In the second quarter, it was 3% nationwide, and it ticked up to about 3.2%. And that was the first increase in vacancies in two years, but still well below the 5% average national vacancy during 2020. Now, about a 263 million square feet were leased in the third quarter. That's down from 207 million square feet in the second quarter, but it's still more than any uh, of the square footage leased during any quarter in 2019. So it's still relatively robust, but it is slowing down and there was skyrocketing demand during the pandemic and in 2022 as households were buying a lot of goods. We've talked about that before. Amazon doubled the size of, of its fulfillment network in the 24 months uh, post pandemic. But now Amazon has halted its growth in warehouse operations, subleasing some of its space to e-commerce uh, uh, rivals. And uh, this is all because of once again, slowing demand. Now, I think the only thing that's keeping it up right now is excessive inventory. Nike's talked about it. Walmart's talked about it. Target's talked about it. A lot of the retailers have talked about it. Now, they're going to try to work through it through the end of this year. But I think through next, starting next year, you're going to have a, a strong pullback in the industrial warehouse space, which, once again, it's been very strong. And companies are more cautious about signing leases uh, because they want to get through till next year, get a clearer picture of what's happening with their business, happening with the economy, et cetera. So if you have companies or thinking about buying companies that are exposed to the industrial warehouse business, you need to understand that the uh, their business is likely to slow uh, and the price per square foot they're going to get, et cetera, is going to come under pressure because we're getting that reversion to the mean. And that's, a, that's what you have to understand about today's market. It's a it's a challenging one because some various types of businesses are slow to revert to the mean. Others have already have done it quickly, right? Retailers are reverted to the mean more than others, right? So they actually could revert the other way positively. Whereas the real estate sector, typically very slow because of long leases. Those are in the process of reverting uh, to a more normal economic environment. And you can be aware of that reversion. Now, I'm Justin Klein, and this completes another Invest Talk program. Steve Peasley and I thank you, and we encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads. And our official Invest Talk download count now exceeds 46 million, thanks to you. Now, get your Invest Talk podcast anytime at iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play, and be sure to rate and review on iTunes. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Invest Talk is a trademark of KPP Financial. Because of the nature of the interactive dialogue inherent in the format of this program, it's important for the listener to understand that not all comments made will apply to them. Specifically, nothing said shall be taken to be investment advice, or shall statements on this program be considered an offer to buy or sell security. Because such advice is rendered solely on an individual basis, and at times will require that the investor review a prospectus before investing. Invest Talk is a copyrighted program of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial, a registered investment advisor firm which retains all rights. For more information regarding KPP's investment advisors, call 1 800 557 5461. Steve Peasley is president, and Justin Klein is chief executive officer of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial. Thank you for listening, and your comments and questions are welcome on our 24 hour listener line at 888 99 chart.